Well, good morning, Christ Hold Fast friends. I'm Bruce Hillman. I'm pastor at uh, Hillside Lutheran Brethren Church and a contributor to Christ Hold Fast. And uh, in uh, our devotions, we're going through the book of Ecclesiastes. Well, um, I have to say I'm a little under the weather today, so you may hear me uh, cough a bit. And I have a special tea with me this morning. I have this Chinese tea called Cam Wo Char. They call it plague tea. And I don't know what this stuff is. I've used it for years, and it's, it's like witchcraft. Um, I don't know if it's an immunity booster or what it does, but it helps uh, your cold go away pretty fast. And I'm also on a decongestant. And so uh, between uh, all these different things, we'll see if I can make sense of what the Bible has to say. But you know what? Uh, I'm sick now. I'm going to be better soon. And then I'm going to get sick again. And it's all futile. It's all meaningless because uh, no matter how healthy I get, I'm going to get sick again. And that was something that the writer talked about last week. And we talked about how everything is meaningless and yet how we should live by promise. And we're going to continue that idea today as we finish up chapter one in Ecclesiastes. And we are going to uh, have some good news for you about Christ as well. So let's get right into it. Uh, we finished with chapter, uh, with uh, verse 11, rather, last time, and now we're going to do uh, verses 12 through 18 in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes, if you want to turn there, 1, 12 through 18. And here's what it says. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. End of reading. Well, last week when we looked at the first 11 verses, he was kind of philosophizing. He was kind of thinking about life, and he was talking about the grand cosmic drama and how ultimately humans don't make an impact and how they don't have any lasting effects and that this was kind of futile. But you might raise the question, well, that's kind of nice if he's philosophizing, but maybe he got up on the wrong side of the bed. Maybe he's just a pessimist. Maybe he's just a grump. Um, there seems like there's a lot of good things that are worth living for in life, and what about that? Those questions are actually what's going to take up the next few chapters of the book that we're going to go in. But now he's going to start to kind of give a, a preface, if you will, of where he's going in the next few parts of the book. And one of the ways he's going to do it is by thinking about epistemology. That is, how do we know what we know? Well, how we know what we know, we have different ways of knowing. One way that we know what we know is from authority. Uh, textbooks, teachers scientists, doctors, we haven't necessarily experienced all the things that they tell us, but we trust them because they're trustworthy authorities, and that's how sometimes we can know things. I might not have been to Brazil, but I can read in a book, I can see a newspaper or whatever, and I can learn something about Brazil, even though I haven't experienced it, because I can know about it by authority. Another way of knowing is by revelation, when God breaks in, and we talked about that last week. We can know things because God reveals things to us. A third way of knowing is another one that's important in the book of Ecclesiastes, wisdom. As we think about the world, as we kind of philosophize, we can make sense of reality. And then there's the last one, the one that our culture probably values the most, and the one that he's going to now spend the next few chapters on, experience. Our life experience, what we actually live, gives us an indication of what is true or what is real or what is ultimate that's out there. Well, if you are going to be someone who wants to answer the question, what is the purpose or meaning of my life, 
And the way he asks that question is specifically in chapter 1, verse 3. He says, what does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? What does a man gain? What's the point? What's his purpose? What advantage does he have? What profit is it? If you're going to answer that question by life experience, then you have to be in the position to be someone who can experience the most out of life. So let's imagine for a second that you're this person. And let's say you have the money of Bill Gates, and you have the intelligence of Einstein, and you have the, uh, the creative and artistic skills of Mozart. And let's assume that you're healthy and that you live in relatively peaceful times. And so you are a human who is most equipped to take in all of the world. You can experience pretty much anything you want to that humanity has to offer, and you get to test the thesis of this book, what is the meaning and purpose of my life? Is it really futile? By just throwing yourself into everything. That's what the author is going to do. And he's going to take us on this journey. What happens if we try to experience, experience everything life has to offer? Would we come to a different conclusion than if we just philosophized? Now, the writer doesn't know Bill Gates, obviously, and he doesn't know Einstein, and he doesn't know Mozart. So he thinks of the one person in his ancient context who is most equipped to experience and answer this question. And the person he comes up with is King Solomon. After all, he's a king, so he has a lot of power. He's incredibly wealthy, and he's incredibly wise. And so most scholars think that Ecclesiastes is not actually written by King Solomon, and there's some clues in later chapters that help us believe this, which I'll show you when we get there. But instead, he's adopting the persona of Solomon. And he's saying, even if I am a king, and I am ultimately rich, and I'm the wisest person who ever lived, and I test this thesis, is life really futile, will I come to the same conclusion? Well, we're going to find that out over the next few chapters. The answer is yes, but he'll take us on that journey and show us how. And he says this, he goes, it's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with, toil, busyness. I have seen everything that is done under the sun. He's taken it all in, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after the wind, or chasing after the wind. You know, it's ridiculous. If you try to catch the wind by chasing after it, you're never going to get it. It's futile. And then he gives us this little proverb, which I think is helpful for our illustration this morning. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. What is crooked cannot be made straight. Um, what he's saying is, you and I live with reality being a certain way, and we don't want to accept that reality is that way. We live our whole lives trying to manipulate the future, to try to be in control, to try to let our wills be done. And we think that if we're wise enough, if we're powerful enough, and if we're rich enough, we would, have, we would have the ability to maximize our control over our environment. And what he's saying is, actually, it's not true. Reality is crooked, and you're trying to make it straight. And you think that human power and human wisdom and human effort and all these things, that you can actually change the way the world works, that change the way that God has made things, and you're going to take a crooked thing and you're going to make it straight, or you're going to count things that don't exist. And you know what? It's just impossible. Human Effort and striving and power and wisdom and wealth are not enough to change what is fundamentally true about the world, which is that death stands as the final kind of arbiter over everything, and everything is futile. It just repeats itself. We cure diseases, but then new diseases come. We invent things, and then they become obsolete, and so on and so forth. So that leaves us with an irony an irony that actually is going to begin to drive the book, an irony that comes in the last little statement that he says here, and I've always loved this verse, and anyone who's thought deeply or studied philosophy can relate with this. For in much wisdom is much vexation, that is confusion, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. You can also translate that word sorrow as, as frustration. He who increases knowledge increases his frustration. Here's the irony of wisdom. We think knowledge is power. And we think 
if we can just get a handle on things, if we could just know more, that will put us in a position to better manipulate, to better have control over our environments, and to bring us that future that we're trying to create. And actually, he says, but the more wise you become, the greater that you aggregate your knowledge, the irony is the more you realize that you're not able to control things. So you have this greater depth of knowledge about the world, but with that comes this kind of double-edged sword, this sorrow in knowing that. But man, it doesn't profit me anything. It doesn't gain me anything. All this knowledge is showing me is actually that reality is bent a certain way and that I can't make it straight, that there are things that are too mysterious for me. I can't see them, and therefore they can't be counted, to go back to his earlier edition. I think of uh, Thomas Aquinas here when he was uh, writing his, uh, his Summa Theologica and, and some other books, and he got to the end and he didn't finish, and his famous statement was, he said all his work was just a pile of straw, an epistle of straw. And you go, wow, how could Thomas Aquinas, who wrote one of the greatest works in theology, one of the greatest works combining theology and philosophy, he gets to the end of his life and he basically just gives up and says, yeah, it's all straw? How could he do that? Because to increase knowledge is to increase frustration, is to increase sorrow. All right. So that's where the writer has taken us so far. And in the next few chapters, we're going to dive into what happens if we just try to live hedonistically? What happens if we try to live wealthily? What happens if we embrace foolishness? What happens if we embrace madness? We're basically going to go through every type of life that you can live and see if the thesis holds that everything is meaningless. But until we get there, what can we take home uh, from us, with us uh, today? Maybe this. Jesus says, come follow me. He says, I am the good shepherd. These are images and metaphors of following after someone instead of trailblazing. Um, if it is true, as the writer of Ecclesiastes is telling us, that we are lost in a cycle of self-seeking, that ultimately what we are trying to do is gain. That is the question of our life. What will I gain? What will I profit? How can I control? How can I manipulate? How can I get the future that I want? Then that ultimately is, is a selfishness at work, right? It's a self-seeking. It's our telos, the goal that we are working towards, whether we know it or not, is a goal for gain. And what contrasts this is Jesus saying, you know what? Why don't you come and follow me? I'm the good shepherd, and I'm going to shepherd you through this. And instead of making your own way, instead of trying to get your own gains over a life that's ultimately futile, come and follow me. And then you get Paul's great statement that I think makes sense of this, which uh, is, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That's an interesting statement in the face of Ecclesiastes. Because death, as we'll see later in the book, is the one thing that brings everything to futility. It's the one thing that stops any newness from happening. It's the one thing that is always in the way. So I make tons of money, but then I die, and I have to leave it to people after me who didn't earn it. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, this is a great evil. This is terrible. And yet Paul has the insight to say, no, wait. For me to live, what it means for me to live, is not for me to profit, but to die is to profit. And that's something that the writer of Ecclesiastes actually isn't able to get grasped because he doesn't fully have the gospel. Well, let me close with this thought. Uh, today, um, if you're like me and you're someone who is has a tendency to be anxious, then you're worried about what the future holds today and then in the coming days. And you're going to want to make, as we talked about last week, a certain type of future. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes is not saying that God doesn't care about your quality of life and that we can have no change or effect on our quality of life. He's thinking big questions here, and he, we're going to start to zoom in. But if you're worried this morning about failure, about messing up, about being embarrassed, about screwing up, whatever it is, uh, something happening that, that's really causing you angst, I think that the book of Ecclesiastes really speaks into this 
when, especially when we put it next to Christ, and gives us an amazing hope. Because what it's saying is that it is not my ingenuity, and it is not my power, and it is not my skill that is going to determine whether or not I have a good life. Because whether I'm rich or whether I'm poor, whether I'm healthy or whether I'm sick, life is ultimately futile anyway. So the only thing that's going to make my life have any significant meaning is if I have Christ. So let me ask, sum this up by asking it this way. What if you didn't have to live your life in the fear of failure? What if the fear of messing up of losing that job, of not getting that promotion, of, you know, not having that breakup happen, what, whatever that is. What if that fear, that anxiety, wasn't powerful enough to derail you from having Christian joy? And by the way, we start to talk about joy in chapter 2. What if that were the case? What if you didn't work uh, so hard to control things and instead knew that Christ was enough for you. Wouldn't that be a huge release to your anxiety if the futility of life was instead put in the shadow of Christ? What would, what would that do? So in other words, let me, I could say it this way. Um, I have all these fears about what today is going to bring, about what tomorrow is going to bring, about what next week's going to bring. I have a particularly a lot of stress going on at work right now, just a lot of things happening. And I find myself going, Bruce, I don't know how you're going to get through all this. Perfectly natural response. But you know what then I try to do? I try to uh, control things. Uh, I try to set my schedule. I try to do And the more I try to control, the more anxious I get. Because the more I realize I actually don't have the level of control that I want. So what I have to do is I have to look to Christ. I have to look to Christ because as I look to Jesus, what I find is that Jesus alone is the one who is going to shepherd me. He's the good shepherd. He is going to get me through this. So even if I fail, it'll be okay. The fear of failure is a fear of a lack of significance, a lack of messing up, a lack of not being able to handle life. And Christ, when I look to him instead of myself, when I look to his power instead of my power, when I live in the reality of his promises instead of the reality of my uh, intuition or my skill or my power, I find that my anxiety level is able to go down. Because only the gospel says something that no other religion, and to my knowledge, no other philosophy says. It doesn't matter if you fail. It doesn't have to affect your happiness. It doesn't have to affect your peace. If everything doesn't go according to plan, if bad things happen, if tragedy happens, even if death happens, it's game. It's game. Because we have Jesus. And so I'm going to try to live today, not by looking at what Bruce can do, but by looking at what Christ can do and putting my hope in him. Because everything here is temporary. Whatever I have to go through today, it's temporary. And at the end of the day, what I have is the gospel. And the gospel truly does give me grace and that very important part that we sometimes forget, peace. Because Christ puts into context my life. And I go, you know what? God doesn't promise me that I won't have to suffer. But I don't have to fear that suffering as ultimately defeating me. Because Christ has defeated death. Christ is going to walk through suffering with me. And therefore, uh, I am equipped and I am ready. So I can live in the joy of the resurrection, and I can look to Christ, because my future ultimately is Christ, not my own self-made path that ends in futility. So thank you for listening today, and I hope that's encouragement to you today. Look to Christ, live in the reality of God's promises, and uh, continue to pray that God will give you that grace and peace that he so promises. Because I know, and you know, we all need it. Thanks for listening.